welcome friends to this monthly meeting that we have so that we can keep on track on our spiritual journey our minds being what they are our obligations and responsibilities towards other activities in this life our jobs our families our responsibilities elsewhere do not give the time to have a continuous attention to our spiritual journey that is why these frequent meetings together which we call a satsang are important on our spiritual progress satsang just a hindi expression sat means the truth sang means the company the company of the truth is a satsang when we meet here we want to have the company of the truth the truth lies within ourselves when we ask this question what is true we get very different answers what is really the ultimate truth can we say that this world is true is not it's a created thing temporarily created when something changes we can't call it really true if anything can change it cannot be considered as true what is really true is which will never change because truth is never changing when we look around what is never changing we find that our lives are changing our bodies are changing our families are changing our business is changing the whole world is changing the galaxies are changing the universe is changing everything is changing if you look deeply what is not changing is the one that is observing the change whoever that one is the observing the change is not changing sitting in human bodies right here we know that we are observing this universe and each other and the family obligations and this business obligations the job obligations from within this body therefore the truth must lie within this body certainly at this point when we have a physical body and this is the only place from where we can observe something the truth must lie inside which does not change and that is indeed the most important thing that one can discover the discovery of one's own self that observes but is not part of what is being observed that the observation is something that is happening which is changing but the observer does not change the self we don't know what word to use when i use the word self automatically everybody everybody says i am myself you are yourself there are so many selves the word self does not actually say what exactly we are talking about because we are talking about one observer alone not two observers not two selves only one self that does not change but when we say myself and yourself we change therefore that cannot be the truth the truth is that there is one self that creates and observes at the same time that to discover that self has been the goal of all philosophers and mystics who have come before us and told us if you want to be enlightened and you want to solve all the problems of mysteries that you have been watching discover your own self know thyself socrates said that long ago know thyself the self first question people ask me which self are you talking of who self your the mind a very common question i have to go back to the example that i often give of what happens when we sleep and have a dream when we go to sleep and have a dream in the dream we see many people and we talk to each other in the dream and then we say who is dreaming all this if there is only one dreamer and everybody in the dream can say you i we don't know who maybe somebody all of us are dreaming but when you wake up you find it was only one dreamer the rest were characters of the dream created within one dreamer not in many dreamers you don't dream together you dream by yourself and create another another person or many persons or many worlds you can in an instant create a whole big world a universe 
just by the process of dreaming. That means one dreamer can make several dreamers in a dream and when one wakes up, one discovers it was only one dreamer. This is exactly the situation that we are in today. This world has been created like a dream. The self is sleeping to create the dream. When I say sleeping, it may not be sleeping in the sense in which your body sleeps. Sleeping in the sense it is not conscious of its form, conscious of it being what it is when it is dreaming in a sleep state. What is the difference between a sleep state and our wakeful state? The difference is that in the sleep state, we become unconscious of the body in which we are now. In the dream state, we create a different body and many bodies. And we create a whole world. And we do not create a whole world from the time we start dreaming. We create a world which has been existing forever. Have you ever noticed that when you go to sleep and have a dream, in the dream you can see an old building and you can check how old was that building? Several thousand years old. And then you wake up and you discover a thousand year old building was created a few seconds after you started dreaming. It is not the time in which we are dreaming that actually creates the time factor. We create infinite time, infinite space every time we dream. And that is of course infinite space, infinite time of a dream state. When we wake up, that ends. In the dream, if somebody were to ask you, how far can we go in this world, you say infinite. How long will this world last? Infinite. You wake up and you end the world immediately. Your world of infinite time, infinite space has been created in a few moments of sleep. Now consider that if this is the situation we are in right now, our self is only one. Asleep, that means unaware of its own state, of what it is, and has created a state in which we can experience we are an observer. But we find lots of other people in this world and they are all part of the one self's dream. When the self awakes, they all become part of the same self. This is the truth because that self never changes. And it's that self that we have to find. I was again remembering some of Baba Fakir Chang's old satsangs. He was, uh, a, he was a mystic who people thought is a mystic who knows nothing because he claimed he knows nothing. He again and again said, I know nothing. And he said that he had been initiated by a perfect master who taught him how to go within, how to have strange experiences of light and sound. He saw lights and colors which don't exist outside. And he described them. He said they were such beautiful colors. He saw sights. He saw powers existing in himself which he never saw outside. He was able to see the state of being where he could see so many wonderful places. He said he might have even seen Sajkhand, the true home. After seeing all, said, all these things, he said he found nothing. Because these were all experiences. It was not experience. He said I did not find the self. The whole exercise was to find the self. And I was only seeing what the self is creating. He said that is why I did not know anything till people began to tell me that when they meditate they see me because I have initiated them. They come and tell me we see you. In one very interesting case with, we made people laugh. He said once there was a lady in the same town, Musharpur in India, who had at night very big pain in her belly and she couldn't find any medicine. She prayed to her master, Baba Fakir Chang. She said, Baba Ji, I can't suffer this much. Please help me. And Baba Ji appeared in front of her. He could see him standing. He said, daughter, don't worry. There is some black salt lying on the shelf there. Dissolve it in water and take it. She got up and took that black salt and pain was gone. She said, thank you, Babaji, and Babaji disappeared. Next morning, she ran to him 
and said, thank you very much for solving me a problem. It was so excruciating pain and you came and helped me and gave me simple remedy that was already lying there. And Babaji says, my daughter, I want to tell you something. I am not in the habit of going into women's rooms at night. <laughs> it was not me. Don't think it was me. I don't do these kind of things. It was you, yourself. She said, but no, I saw you. You talked to me, you gave me this instruction to take that medicine. He said, no, the reason why you thought it was me is because I and you, being separate here, are drawing our experience from the same single source. We are indeed only one. And when you had that experience of seeing me, you were tapping into the same source, which is in me and you both. That is why Baba Fakirchan said, I myself learned that the whole direction of spiritual journey should be to discover the self, not discover a variety of experiences. You can have wonderful experiences here. You can have them on the astral plane. You can have on the causal plane. You can go to your true home and have great experiences, dancing and singing of souls. You can see everything. But you're not discovering the self. You're only finding out what the self can do, what the self can find. To discover the self solves all the mysteries. To know who we really are. And that is why this path, this journey is toward that which takes us to the one self which it never changes and therefore is the truth. That is why it's appropriate when we talk of that self and when we talk of reaching that self, we are indeed doing a satsang. We are in the company of the truth. Otherwise, it's not a satsang. If we just meet for a social gathering and we chat with each other and compare notes, what we did last night, where we went for a party or something, that's not a satsang. Satsang is the ability to join together and discover what our true self is. And what a remarkable thing that all of us sitting here, which look so many of us sitting here, are actually one. And to discover that one, we start from where we feel that one exists. Where we can imagine and accept that we know where that self is who is observing a creation. We are observing this creation from within the body. We are using the best part of this body to look around the eyes. Eyes are the first part of the body that looks out. And without eyes, our means of seeing the world are much less reduced. So that is why the eyes are like the window of ourself. They say eyes are the window of the soul. The soul is merely a term used to describe the self. The soul creates everything, observes everything and might be called the another name for the self. The eyes of this, of this body are being used by the soul in the body to observe, to see, to look out. Then, if you have to find where the self is, the best part is to trace from where it is observing from the eyes. The best part is to see what is behind the eyes, what's inside the head. When we open our eyes, we're seeing what's inside that is seeing. Maybe we're getting close to the self if we start like that. The truth is, when we close our eyes, we can feel we are there. That's another great thing. That when we sit in a wakeful state, in a dream state, we have another body. We can't use that for this purpose. In the wakeful state in which we are right now, this is the best state to be in to discover the truth. I do not know any other state of consciousness which is better suited to discover the self than this wakeful state of a human being. In this wakeful state, we close our eyes. Just because we are looking out, we close our eyes and don't look out, we still feel we are right behind the eyes. We do not feel that we are in our hands. From where we are, hands are at a, at a distance and connected to us through the body. The feet, the rest of the torso, the whole body is connected to us, but connected in the wakeful state from behind the eyes. Therefore, the search for the truth, the search for our soul, 
the search for our ultimate one self has to begin from there to discover who sits behind the eyes that can observe and see everything that must be our own true self but if we don't do that supposing we don't do this exercise then our whole body moving around in this world looks like ourselves if we don't think of what is behind the eyes and we just roam around in this world then the whole world we are observing and the whole body is ourself that moves around that does various things so we are mistaking the body for the self because we don't close our eyes and ask the question are we behind the eyes if we don't ask this question the whole body is our self the moment you close your eyes and ask this question who am i i am not the body not my hands i am sitting behind the eyes i am somebody that is behind the eyes and not outside and you put this question you are already on the spiritual journey toward the self if you can stay there longer and examine is the self that you are now looking at is it as active as the self which we say is the body and to your amazement when we test this out you find that the self that is sitting behind the eyes is yourself it's not somebody else you are knowing that you are there when you find that out you find you can stand up you can sit down you can eat you can drink you can do anything you want that the body can do and a lot more lot more includes one extra activity you can fly if you ever try to fly behind the eyes close your eyes and know you are there in that space between the two parts of the eyes and the head only this little part and have you tried to go there say let me see if i can fly you fly do you know that self has no weight no gravity you might say that what i am telling you is imagining it's just imagining that you are there that's true true that's correct but the question is who is imagining the same self we are trying to reach the self we are not analyzing whether the self is doing imagining now or is looking with the eyes outside or is eating food or whatever it's doing we are not looking at what is doing we are seeing what is the self a self that has characteristics inside the eyes which does not have outside if you can really fly can you open the window of that head and fly anywhere you like one or once you will know and in the meditation workshops we do these things and we will be doing again later this month in another imr you know by the way, imr is not the medical uh, term that's mri but somebody told me i am mri i didn't know myself that they had bridged the words intensive meditation retreat into imr so next one is taking place in new mexico everybody will fly i know because the self hidden inside this body in the wakeful state operating as an active active being inside the body can fly it can fly into space which is outside the head it can create its own space and time just like we create space and time when we go to a lower level of awareness in a dream state we create a different space and time in the higher state of wakefulness wakeful but not tied down to the body being the self then we are able to go behind and from the eye say let me see this was a small little dark chamber but i can see things that's what happens if you if i make this room completely dark you can't see anything but inside if it's completely dark you can still see how is that possible how is a vision possible you can completely block your eyes you can cover them and tie them up and create complete darkness inside your head you can still see everything whatever you imagine you can see how can you see something in complete darkness because when you close your eyes and see you are creating the light in the things you are seeing that's why you see them it's a very interesting experience when you want to fly even beyond the physical body you can because the experience is not limited to the physical body now supposing you were to say that is not 
what I thought I was, I thought I was a physical body. Now I find there's something else inside. Is there something more that is not even in that body? Yes, that body has eyes. And those eyes can close. You can open and close the inner eyes of the inner body, not this one. These are already closed. The inner body that's moving around can fly, get up, sit down by imagination inside, can also close its eyes. When it closes its eyes and wants to discover, then what happens? There is no body that flies even. You are still there. The self is still there. This process of being able to narrow down the location where you can find the ultimate truth, your own self, is a very practical one just by going more and more within yourself and within or what is within yourself. People don't follow that. People are so tied to the physical body when they do meditation, they are quite content with the first step. Yeah, we have somebody there which we think is our self or soul. That's not your soul. The soul does not change. It's the self. This body inside also changes, just like the body outside. By going further within yourself, by closing the eyes of the inner body, and then saying, who am I? You can create universes at that point. You create a whole universe. It's a practical thing. I'm suggesting a way to discover the truth. And on the way, you will find such wonderful things that you can create universes just by two steps. Close these eyes and go behind the eyes and find out who you are. Close the eyes of the inner being and see that you are a creative power that creates the universes. Easy. It gives you big knowledge, a big awareness that the creative power of creating universes lies within yourself inside. It's not outside anywhere. But that's not the end of our journey. For most people who say they are enlightened, that was the end of the journey. When they discovered that the whole universe can be created from a power just by closing these eyes, putting attention on the being inside, closing those eyes, putting attention on the being inside, they found the power to create universes, the power to understand everything, the power to create languages, the power to communicate, the power to everything that's happening in this world. And that discovery was that we are not merely bodies. We are not merely bodies that have sensory perceptions of seeing, touching, tasting, flying. We are beings that can create the whole universe. And that part of us, which we discovered now, which many of the great enlightened souls said is our soul. And I tell you, it's not the soul. It was the mind. This creative power in space and time it does not require you to go to the soul. The mind can do it easily. But since the mind at that point does it in such a clever way that it creates all beings, creates all people, and everything is being created from there, we call it the universal mind. But one thing you will notice, that the universal mind still operates in time. There's still time flowing. As you're doing that, you're creating the universes in time. Time is a prerequisite for creating universes. Time and space both are prerequisites. They are required before you can create anything into them. And you are doing it right there. Then what happens? You will observe that the power you have of a universal mind within your own self, which you discovered by going two steps, you take a third step, which of course requires a little intervention from inside. Because all this exercise I'm telling you, one can do it with the force of willpower and one's mind. Everyone can do that. After that, you can't do any more because the very instrument you are using to do all this is the mind, it's the universal mind. You reach the universal mind, you can go no further with the mind. Then you need something else. Now that is where the rare, rare chance of discovering the true self within the universal mind comes up. The only power that I have discovered, which can give you an experience beyond the universal mind, is the power of love 
emanating from inside the mind, pulling you beyond the mind. The power of love that's inside, behind the mind, within the mind, inside, when that pulls you, it takes you to your soul, to the self. How do we have that? How do we experience a love of that kind which is not in your control? Because all things that are in our control are controlled by your mind. You can't control anything that's not controllable by the mind. And here we are talking of love pulling you. Mind has no role in it. How do you get that experience of love pulling you? Now, it would be almost impossible if that was the structure of our human body. And that's all we could do. But no. The human body with a soul inside is experiencing love all the time. It's flowing through all the time. It flows into the mind. The mind can think about it. It flows in the experiences we have of love, loving people, loving things. We attach ourselves to things. Therefore, we call them, we love, I love this flower, I love this picture, I love all of you. All this experience we are talking day and night about love is coming from where? It's coming from where it exists. And it does not exist in the mind at all. It does not exist in the sense perceptions. It does not exist in the body. It does not exist in the one that can fly. It does not exist in this body. Where is it coming from? It's coming from the very place where we want to go. It's coming directly from the soul. Thoughts can come from the mind. Understanding can come from the mind. Rationalization can come from the mind. Love cannot come from any other source except the soul. And soul is behind, beyond the mind. Since it's coming from there, we don't recognize it. We use that force that's coming automatically in all of us. If it did not come, we would be dead. We can't be surviving here if love was not in all of us already. That love already inside us is expressing itself in something in this world. It's not pulling us. We are not pulling, using that love to go within. We are using it to go outside. More outside, more attachments, more loving people, more loving things, more loving experiences outside. The very love that's coming from our source, from the soul, is being applied by us in various ways. It even loses its own real texture, its real beauty. The real beauty of love is something very different from how it's applied here. It's being applied by working through the mind, not away from the mind. When you apply love through the mind, what happens? The mind uses it through its face. That facing is outside. And that face is called ego. I-ness. This I, me. What, when you say I, what does it mean? It means I am not you. I am separate. The separation that the mind creates, and that separation is what we call the I. If there was no separation, there would be no I. The I is being used by the mind to create a separation from everything. From the world, from the people, from the things that we are trying to love. Love, on the other hand, is trying to pull you away from the separation. And we are using the same love to separate. Because we are pumping it through the I, the mind. Now, can we do something to separate it from the mind? Sorry. You can't. Because all attempts you make to do anything in the world is done by the mind. Attempt, effort, trying, these words only apply to the mind. And since we can't do anything more than that, we say we want to redirect our love to pull us within, beyond the mind, and we're using the mind again. To do that won't work. It has to be a love that is coming from inside us, from beyond the mind, and activate it so that it is not used by the I. That the I ego of the human mind is not going to use it or apply it. Here comes the role of another human being who is different from the others. The difference from the others is that the others, when you love them, they draw you to themselves. He is a human being who comes into your life and draws you within yourself. He bypasses the process of the mind. As a human being, ordinary human being, he bypasses the process of the mind 
and operates from within you, operates from beyond your own mind. But we can't see it because he is separate. The I, the ego is already making that person separate. He is an ordinary human being, has to be, just like us. Because we in this world have a true feeling of experience where I get suppressed only with a human being. When you say, I love my house, the I is very strong. I love my children, I is very strong. Little less than a house. Why? Because the children can make you forget the I. You can be so absorbed in the children, you forget the I. House, you can't forget it. The house doesn't do the same thing as child does. What's the difference? Child is human, like yourself. When we say, I love my new car that's come, the I is very strong. When you say, I met a person and I fell in love immediately, then the I is very weak because the person is a human being. If you examine this really, you will find that if you want to experience an I, a love without I, it has to be with a human being. And a human being who has the capacity to bypass the mind in your head, not his head. It should be in your head, otherwise no use. A human being that pulls you to himself or herself is not helping you to get pulled inside yourself. But if there is a human being who, when he appears in our life, can operate from within yourself. Now, how can one operate from within another person? That can only happen, thanks to the teachings of Baba Fakir Chand, that can only happen if his awareness, his consciousness is of that one, which is the same one in you and that person. And that's the definition of a perfect living master. A perfect living master does not come here to create any change here, to create religions, to create spiritual traditions, to create spiritual societies. Does not come here for any stuff outside at all. A perfect living master comes to operate from the one eye, the single self that's in you and the perfect living master at the same time. That's why Baba Fakir Chand was right. That when you say, I see that person outside, I also see inside in meditation, it's because that person is operating in awareness from the single self. If that were not so, this wouldn't happen. When that happens, as you have been able to have some experiences of different forms of the self, which it is using, outside forms, this physical body, the flying body, the astral body, weightless body inside, the thinking mind, the causal body, the rationalizing body inside us, the mind. But you've seen these three things and they are operating even now. All of us are having these operating all the time. And then you see the self that is actually working in these things and a trigger comes outside in a physical world in the wakeful state and the trigger is really coming from a single source which we don't know it's in the person that's triggering it and your own self. It's simultaneous. Therefore, when that happens, and we all experience it, there is something happening which is not ordinary. Person is ordinary. The person doing it is ordinary person. But something is happening in us, within ourselves. That is the love from within the self which is pulling us. The role of that human being be whom I address as perfect living master. Perfect because perfection only exists beyond the mind. He operates from there. Living because he is living trigger here. If we don't see him, if we don't meet him, the trigger doesn't work. If we don't meet that person, what works is our own mind. When we meet that person, he bypasses our mind and the love that we experience even with that person here is not of the self. That we think is the self, which means not of mind, body or the senses. It is coming from the source, which is only one. And that is why a perfect living master, an ordinary human being, comes and he performs no other role. He is just giving you the experience of love. The only experience that will take you beyond the mind. And that experience 
is being translated into a pool of your own self within. If that happens, supposing you have that experience, supposing you are pulled by your own love and you discover that the mind was merely an attachment, just a body, just a cover. Senses were must a cover. This physical body just a cover upon ourself. And you find that, what will you find? You will find you and that trigger the master were one all the time. You thought they were separate. With that experience, that difference disappears. You reach the source. That is why when we are trying of the source, it's only one. The dream takes place at the source. The dreamer is only one. The creator is only one. The ultimate creator is only one. Nothing else exists except the ultimate creator. But we create experiences around the creator. And all we are doing right now is, is an experience around the creator. It just happens that in the experience that has been generated by this one creator, one being, one power, it manifests in the experience as if it is in many. That's beautiful. Can you imagine that there is one being and can become so many? And have an experience, there are so many of us. And world upon world, and create everything that's possible and make that alive. And what survives that, what makes it alive is the creative power of that one. How can you describe something? Supposing you say, talk to me about the creative power. It has no form. It, it just creates. Can I in any term describe it? I do not know any language that can describe God or the creator. No language exists. To be able to explain that there is something which has that creative power to create all kinds of experiences, including the ones we're having now, and yet that all the experiences are existing within that one, that nothing exists outside of it. The mind makes it separate. Mind says, I and my God. You are not talking to God at all in that case. If you have separated yourself from God, how can he be God? God is only one. Not one God. One everything. There is nothing outside of it. None of us are outside of it. The whole experience is inside that one. It has never been happening that the experience took place outside. It just looked outside. It appeared to be outside by creating space and time. All the experience we are having right now is happening within that one. And when you discover the one, how can you describe it? The moment you try to describe it, you become separate. And then you are lost. The mind trying a game. Trying to describe that one is the mind game and tries to lose the reality of what we are talking about. Imagine that you discover, your discovery of the self is discovery of everything. Discovery of yourself, discovery of entire creation. Discovery of yourself is discovery that not only we have to think we are one, we are one. We are completely one. That's the self. The only truth. But the beauty is that the only truth, which is one, everything has taken place within that one. Nothing happened outside of it. And yet, that very one, which contains everything, is available to us at this moment that we are so many. And each one of us who are sitting here can think, am I the only one? Am I creating all of us? No. You are, in this gathering, we are not creating anything. What we are thinking about is creation. We are the created beings. We are looking at experience. Our body, everything is being created from the one which we are unaware of. We have closed our awareness of the one in order to make the reality of the experience. That's what reality is. This reality is merely an experience. There's nothing real. Nothing created ever is real in the sense of truth. Reality as truth. Real truth cannot be more than one. And every time we speak, we talk of more than one. That's why no language has been able to Explain. It's very difficult what, what words to use. 
to describe a state of our own being, our own truth, our own reality. We have no words, no language. Yet, I read recently a very interesting thing. And that is about language. The spoken word. The spoken word says, if I do not know the word flowers, the word, spoken word, if I do not know the spoken word flowers, I cannot see these flowers. Now flowers are there. My eyes are open. How, can, how come I can't see them? I, I, if I don't have the word flowers in any language whatsoever, and then I look at the flowers, there will be some splash of green, yellow color, making no sense at all. The word flowers is making them flowers. How did this come up? Because recently they investigated that there are so many colors of the rainbow, the spectrum, and people discovered these colors in historical terms, we go back in history, a few thousand years ago, they did not have too many colors, black and red, white, black, red, then they added more. The last color to be added is blue. In the ancient writings available to us, the text written 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, do not mention the word blue at all, anywhere. Blue is a new discovery. Therefore, they are not describing anything of blue color. Not even the sky they can't describe. All descriptions are minus blue. When blue was discovered, the enhancement of the world took place and they began to see another color. And that color became part of their picture. It's a very important discovery in the sense that we sometimes think the spoken word is no good. Ultimate word is the shabd, the sound that comes from our true home. The spoken word is equally important. The spoken word is the only way we can understand and see something that's going to happen. The spoken word can describe non-physical events. The spoken word can describe things which cannot be seen. Look at one word. Look at the word beauty. We use it, beauty. Can anybody see beauty? No, you can see beautiful people. You can see beautiful things. You can see application of the word beauty all over, but you can't see beauty. Look at the word jealousy. The whole world knows what it is. We've all experienced it. And yet, you can see in people, you can see in places, but you can't see jealousy as such. Yeah, it's a word. It's not a word only for application. It's a word that when we go within, we discover we can see jealousy. We can see beauty. We can see the words we are using here as meaningful. Here they only become meaningful when applied to outside things. And they become meaningful without it. The spoken word, which we call the Varanatmak Shabd, it's also, it's also sound. The spoken word is also sound. Now this kind of sound that we speak with in a language, we have designed the words to come up according to our experience as it grows. Like we believe we all evolved. Historically, we were like cavemen and had very few tools, very few experiences, very few words. As we grew to more complicated society, we're having more and more words. Every day we add more words now. We have words which can describe abstract things. We can talk of spirituality. We can talk of things that are beyond anything here, just by words. The words are still sound. They are phonetic symbols. How they are created, that's the beauty of it. The experience generated has tying up to the spoken word that we use for that experience. A child is born. And from my experience, I know that the child knows a lot more, even in words. It, it, it has been hearing before its birth. From the fifth month of pregnancy, when the quickening took place in the mother's womb, Till then, the child keeps on hearing words from outside and has learned a lot of vocabulary by the time it's born. It cannot speak. But as it begins to see things outside of the mother, it hears the same word. The mother calls them flowers. The child looks at this strange combination of colors called flowers. A second time, third time, it becomes flowers. But only those flowers the mother has shown. 
later on the child grows up and finds other people calling different flowers also as flowers so the meaning of the word flowers expands ultimately a child grows up the meaning of every word expands to cover everything this was explained very well in the socratic tradition plato described this where socrates is telling plato this world is made up of ideas which have been expressed in language and he gives an example the example which he gives of a chair we are all sitting on our chairs it is not one chair there different chairs mine is different from that how did it happen that so many different variety of objects are all called a chair explain that the word chair was not coined here it was coined where imaginatively we could sit where the idea of a chair came it did not come here when we say inspiration and we get inspiration imagination we can imagine things new things that's where every word has come from every experience has come from when we have similar experience here when the idea came that one could sit on a place higher than the ground the idea came it can be something which we can sit higher than the ground first the concept of having to sit or sitting high or low the concept came first it came from the mind the concept could be translated into an idea and an idea that there could be something which can be raised and we can sit on it now imagine what this concept and this idea is applies to all chairs not to one chair then we begin to see the chairs here it's a translation of that one idea you can have an idea of one chair and create all millions of types of chair it still be called a chair this explanation that he is given shows the power of the varnatmak shabd of the spoken word the spoken word without the spoken word we can move nowhere on a spiritual journey the spiritual journey requires the spoken word that is why the very first step on the spiritual journey is to understand through language that is spoken and written it's a sound it's a phonetic sound that means chair when i say it's just an english word the, the sound we listen to is chair which may have no meaning unless we see a chair supposing somebody is talking of chair 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 all the time we have never seen a chair there's no value for us we talk of god 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 nobody has seen god there's no value at all the repetition of the word has no value the repetition of this phonetic symbols we call words or language is only when they relate to one of that kind to which we associate it is an association of ideas with an actual experience of something that creates a word the the word which we call a sound is audible main thing is that there is a possibility in our body as it is now which has of course the physical body the flesh and bones and all and then there is the astral body the sense perceptions which we can touch taste smell we feel all those things are inside us then we have the mind inside which can think rationalize understand all these are built into the system but the soul which is inside which creates the feeling that we can move the life the life force that enables us to move enables us to see touch taste smell enables us to think the life force is not in any of these the life force is coming from the soul how it operates is very simple it is if i may use this word conscious now conscious can mean aware but that's not what i mean you say i'm conscious of something people you are aware of something no there's a difference consciousness is the ability to be aware it's more it's potential it's a potential in us that we can we can become aware it does not mean we are aware it means we have a capacity in us to become aware and that capacity is what i call consciousness not awareness awareness is the application of consciousness into something to which we have now become aware but was hidden till we became aware so that is why consciousness is the source 
all awareness and awareness is the source of all creation. If you are not aware of something, it doesn't exist. Whatever we know is there is awareness. It does not mean it should be physical, visual awareness. It can be awareness in the head. It can be awareness through memory. You seen something earlier, you are aware of it. And it's an application of consciousness to creation. Creation is being taking place from consciousness turning into awareness. Consciousness is total. Total because it can create awareness of anything. No limits. Awareness is limited. How much you have created. These are very fundamental uh, things happening in us. That consciousness is the soul. The potential to create anything and become aware of it is in the soul. That's our true self. That is why in consciousness everything is hiding. Again we have problem with words. Buddha, Gautam Buddha was trying to explain that there is a hidden everything inside but not manifest. So he said if nothing is there visible or manifest how do we call it? At the end from there everything can come out. He called it, called it nothingness. And he said, nothingness is not nothing. It is nothingness. That from nothingness, everything can come out. But there is a source of everything and that is included in that which is not manifest. It does not exist for our senses. It does not exist for our mind. It does not exist for any faculties we have. Yet it is there. And it is there inside us, in the soul. The discovery of the self is such a magnificent journey. That you can go to the source of nothingness and find that everything can come out of it. And everything else can go back into nothingness also. This process is continuously going on of becoming aware of something and becoming unaware of it. It's coming from that consciousness, goes back into consciousness. So when we are using these words like consciousness, and I add another word to it to make it all inclusive to come to as close as I can to that oneness, one truth only, the totality of consciousness, just words. I feel very dissatisfied when I use those words to describe the ultimate creative power. But there is no language. Totality of consciousness means there is the potential to create or do anything, unlimited completely. And then out of that, a limited experience is being created. And that limited experience is being created from our being in one of, in part of the creation. It is like this. We are one being and we create, say, a hundred others who look like us. That means one human cell in the human body has created one hundred selves. Does it mean is that body who has created that? No. Is the mind of this person created that? No. What has created the whole thing is that which created the body of this knower also. We forget that. When I tell people, you are the creator of everything, they look at themselves, oh, am I creating? Let me create something. You can't create a cup of water. Because you are yourself the creation. The creator sits inside your creation, picks up one, one part of creation and sits inside that's what's happening. The creator, the ultimate creator, the total creator, the only one, all-inclusive, everything, creates and sits in a small part of the creation. That's what it is. The whole creator, not part of the creator, the whole creator sits in one observer in the creation and makes that one observer an observer of the entire creation. That's our situation. Therefore, when we go within ourselves, it's a series of wakefulness, series of awakening to discover that we thought there are so many, they were all a projection of one. They were all a creation of one. The wonderful journey to the oneness of our own self, the, the journey to a truth, the journey to the ultimate truth and ultimate reality which never changes, which is our own creative self. That's the most interesting journey. Of course, there's such wonderful sights and sounds on the way. You can enjoy them. I remember an 18-year-old girl 
a British girl came to India and was initiated by the great master. She was a really great mark soul. Beautiful girl. In fact, so beautiful that when I attended satsang, the king tried to look at her. <laughs> rather than great master. That girl did not turn her face away from great master for even a single moment. I never got a chance for her to glance back at me. <laughs> you know, as teenagers, we are the same age or maybe a little younger than her. But once she got initiated and once she had experience, she wrote a letter to Great Master a few days later. And Great Master used to have many people corresponding in the English other languages to assist him. One of them was my grandfather. So the letter that he sent in reply to her was shown to me. I saw her letter. The reply Great Master sent. Her letter showed how much distractions there are in meditation. We think the distractions are outside. There are more distractions inside. And she said in the letter how she can be caught up for all times if the Master doesn't drag her to higher level of consciousness. There are so many. And the Great Master says, why worry? Your going home is guaranteed. Enjoy the way. Enjoy the way. It's a nice picnic. Have picnic. Have it's a journey. Enjoy yourself. Great Master never said that any level of experience you are having, don't walk away from it and become a recluse and become a, 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 what they call people who leave everything and go into the forest to meditate. Don't become like that. Live in this world. Enjoy this world. But do not become so much entangled in the world that you forget it's just a show. If you can remember, this is just a show taking place and you have been placed in a very vantage point to be in the middle of the show, created by your own true self. Enjoy the show. That's why it was created. If you have to run away from this world, why did you create it in the first place? You didn't create something to run away from it. You create it to see it. The mistake is not in being in this world. The mistake is in getting attached and forgetting that we came only to see the show. Just correct this. Correct this perception that this world has not been made for you to run away from it, but to enjoy it. Have maximum opportunity to see what interaction you can have in this world. Keeping in mind all the time this was a temporary thing set up. For that purpose, you have to go back home. That's all. If you do not attach yourself and try to make things your own, as if to possess them, own them. Even possession is not so bad. Owning is the worst thing. That we try to own things here. You get a house to live in. Beautiful. No, I own my house. <laughs> then what happens? A little difference between living in a house, enjoying it, and suddenly saying, I'm the owner of the house. Mm -hmm. If you own the house and you want to, you are pushed away from the house, you will cry, I lost my house. It was my house, I lost. <laughs> but if the house has just been given for you to use, you say, okay, I used it, now I go to another place. I have another bigger house. This little change in your attitude helps so much to understand that this is a creation for using it, for enjoying it, for going through it for having adventure in it. We have come here for adventure, not for getting tied down here. We never came with any tension. And the point is very simple. The house that you say I own, you die, you are no longer the owner. What did you own really? You own nothing. You owned only the use. You own the use of it. Why not realize earlier, before you die, it's only for use. If you can just change that, perspective on the creation around you and say these are all meant to be used and after using we have to go away and the proof of that you will go away is death of the physical body if you could say oh those people who are living there they live forever I'll say congratulations they can own what they like nobody is like that but if you say everybody is dying we will all die one day the body will go how can the body own anything? And we try to, most of our problems arise from owning things, not from using them. 
when we start to own, we try to own people also. That's my so and so, my so and so. We try to own. If if you so the practical tip these masters give us is that since you cannot say I don't own it because you owned it, you paid for it. The mind says I paid a price for it. How do you say I don't own it? Then the best thing they say, the actual practical tip they give is that let the master own it. He is a human being like yourself. He can own it. He doesn't need it. He won't take it for ownership. He is himself bothered with his own ownerships. Masters tell us, you are bringing this issue that take this, take this, and we are ourselves not needing. Yeah. Therefore, if we say everything in our head, Master, you own it. We possess it. You own it. You give it uh, to use. We are going to use it as best as we can because we don't want to displease or mess up with the owner of the place. The things are owned by the master. Every Everything we are doing is owned by the master. We are working within the will of the owner. And the owner is the master. If these thoughts come to us, we will make our life much easier and our spiritual journey faster. It's a simple change of perspective on what we are having around us. When people try to own things which they know they will never carry. I know people younger than me or somewhat older than me are making plans. If I do this, if I take that property there, it will have a capital value and after 20 years we will get so much. <laughs> after that, the next day, dead. What happened to the 20 year plan? We are all making these 20 year plans and plans. Oh, what will happen after this? And we never live to see that plan. Why are we so engrossed in owning things, making them our own, which will never become our own? People can say, Are you trying to detach people? No, I'm not detaching. I'm only saying that don't be attached. It's not the same thing. If you are attached to something and you transfer this attachment by saying, it's not mine, it's master's. You are not detaching, you are just transferring it to somebody who is inside you. You are the real owner still. If you believe that the master who initiates you is inside you, and I tell you, he is. You don't believe it? Check it out. Go in. See, master is inside. If you say you are transferring things to the master, you are transferring things not to the body of the master outside, you are transferring to the master inside. You are just transferring to an unreality, untruth to truth. You are giving your ownership to the truth inside you, not somebody else's truth, your own truth, the single truth. But it works in a real practice when you are aware of this thing, it works. Everything has been given to us for use. Let's use it wisely because we don't own it. The one advantage of this process that I'm talking about is that when you don't own and somebody else is the owner, you take better care of those things because somebody else owns it. You can't be disappointing that person by being careless. If you own, you're careless about it. Therefore, your life becomes one of greater care of everything around you, including people, including things. You are more careful about them. If you know, master owns them, I use them. It's a very simple change of thinking and it helps a lot in the spiritual journey. Because when we meditate upon our own self, which is true meditation, the meditation upon your real self inside is true meditation. You're trying to reach who you really are. When you meditate upon yourself, what happens is, what does not let you stay behind the eyes and work out and see who you are or what you own outside. Those things come up again and again. What will happen to that person? What will happen to that thing? And those things and persons outside are pulling your thoughts away. You can't stay there. Biggest complaint I ever get from people is, we can't stay behind the eyes, although we try. I ask a supplementary question. Why don't you stay? The mind runs all over. Mind runs over to every place except stay where you want it to stay. And main reason 
attachment to things outside of yourself, trying to remember what you own. You, you're not bothered with what other people own. That doesn't inter interrupt your meditation. What interrupts your meditation is what you own outside to which you are attached. That is why it's a simple device. Now, don't think that the master says, give me everything physically. He's saying, just think of it. The master owns. You remember that story of King Janak who showed instant knowledge to uh, Ashtabhakar, his master showed instant knowledge to King Janak. At the end of it, he says, I had asked you to give your wealth, give your bite, give your body to me. I don't need any of these, the master tells. I have a problem with my own. I'm trying to handle my own mind, my own body, and my own senses. I don't need yours. But think of it, he says, think of it as if they belong to the master. It's, this is an internal working of your own self, not externally with the master who is a trigger, physical form outside. It's within yourself that you think, I don't own it, master owns it. You discover the master owns it, it's inside you, not outside. It can make a huge difference to your spiritual journey. Well, I've taken plenty of time explaining something that's so wonderful to explain an ordinary human being coming into our life. Leading a life like ourselves, having karma like ourselves, being born like us, dying like us, getting treatment from hospitals like us, eating food like us, exactly like us, doing everything we do should be coming into our life and be part of our own true self and a symbol of reality outside. That's beautiful. The greatest miracle I can think of. Thank you very much. We'll break for now.